So this, this morning's message happens in two parts, and the first part is with the, with the telling of an ancient story, and in the second part is um, in the, the participation in some science experiments, and we'll have songs in between. And the way I want to tell this story is I want to tell it the way that it happens in the Gospel of Luke, and then I want to say a few words about it, and then I want to offer you a, a contemporary retelling of an ancient story. The story comes from the Gospel of Luke, and it goes like this. On their return, the disciples told Jesus all they had done. Jesus took them with him and withdrew privately to a city called Bethsaida, when the crowds found out about it, the crowds followed him. And he welcomed the crowds and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawing to a close, and the twelve disciples came to Jesus and said, Send the crowd away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But Jesus said to the twelve, you give them something to eat. The twelve said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Are, are we supposed to go out and buy food for everyone? And by the way, everyone is a lot. There were 5,000 people there, according to the story. But Jesus said to his disciples, make the people go sit down in groups of about 50 each. And so the disciples did make them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. And what was left over was gathered up 12 baskets of broken pieces. So this is a story from the New Testament. The story is called the, the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the multitudes. I've also heard it referred to as the multiplication of the fishes and loaves. And the version I've told you is the version from the Gospel of Luke, but this story actually happens four times in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four Gospels contain it. It's the only miracle story to be included in all four Gospels. And what a miracle it is. There are 5,000 hungry people, and they're given five loaves of bread and two fishes, and all 5,000 people are fed, and there's enough left over to fill 12 baskets. Who thinks that sounds difficult to believe? <laughs> yeah. As a, as a child, I was sure that there was a trick in the story. I was sure, oh, there's a trick but they don't tell you. They don't tell you how big the loaves of bread are. The, bro the loaves of bread could have been the size of a bus, and uh, the, the fish could be the size of a whale. That's a trick. No. So one of the ways that, that they teach us to interpret a story is to, is to think about what in your own life the story reminds you of. And it occurs to me that one of the things that this story reminds me of is thanksgiving, that experience of, of the 5,000 people on the hillside eating and eating and the food never running out, that's, that's kind of what Thanksgiving felt like for me as a child. There'd, there'd be turkey and stuffing and heaping bowls of sides, and no matter how much you ate, there was still always this mountain of food in the middle of the table, and, and the food would last for days and days and days, and it's every time you opened your refrigerator, it would be there still. That's what, that's what it felt like. Thanksgiving, we know, is this day of gratitude, but also this day of abundance. This, way, this day, perhaps this day alone among all days, that we as a culture decide that there is not only enough for everyone, but there is, in fact, more than enough for everyone. Kind of like there's more than enough for everyone in the biblical story of the feeding of the 5,000. If you grew up Unitarian Universalist between, say, the 1950s and the 1990s, your religious education program was probably written by a woman named Sophia Lyon Fawes. Sophia Lyon Fawes, three names. That means she's a good Unitarian, like, like Ralph Waldo Emerson or Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Henry David Thoreau. It's the, th the three name thing. And Sophia Lyon Foss wrote a book called Jesus the Carpenter's Son that retold 
the stories of Jesus' life a little differently. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you her story, the retelling of the feeding of the 5,000. Sophia Foz writes, All throughout the city there was a big buzz. Jesus was going to come and give a sermon. The people in the city had heard about these sermons and talks and about the miracles that were sometimes performed when he came. They knew that he was going to come on a road, and so they all gathered on a hillside on the outskirts of town, waiting for him to arrive, wanting to be the first to see him when he came. Nobody was really sure when he would arrive, but nobody wanted to miss him. In fact, everybody wanted to be the first. And so early in the morning, the crowds began to gather on the dusty hillsides on the outskirts of town. As the day wore on, more and more and more people came, and the sun got high in the sky, and people began to get grumpy. Is he going to come? They didn't even know if he's going to come that day or not. And then finally, finally, as the day wore on, and people became more and more and more irritable. Jesus finally came at about 4.30 in the afternoon, came, came rolling down the road. And he began to speak, but Jesus didn't speak for very long before the disciples came, the 12 disciples came and interrupted him and said, the day is almost over. The afternoon shadows are creeping over the hillside Send the crowd away so that they can go into town before it's too late to buy food for themselves. Can't you tell they are hungry and irritable? But Jesus answered, says, is there a need for them to go away? Can't we give them some food? Philip, one of the disciples, answered in amazement, how are we going to go buy food? We, don't, we, only have a few, we only have a few shekels. How could we possibly feed this entire crowd? Jesus asked the disciples, well, well, what do we have? How many loaves do we have? At that point, a young child sitting in the front of the audience overheard Jesus' question and stepped forward and said, well, I, I came with my family. We came with a, with a little picnic. We have, we have five loaves and two fishes left. All You can add that to what you give out and divide them between the crowd. Jesus smiled and beckoning the child to come nearer, stood with uplifted arms and with a strong voice spoke a prayer of thankfulness. Just a few moments after, there was complete silence. Men and women looked wonderingly at each other as if to say, what are these few loaves and fishes among so many people? And just then, someone sitting right behind that, that young child in the front of the audience opened up his cloak and revealed that, that he had brought his own bread and fish that day. But when, when he didn't know how long he would have to wait, he pretended like he didn't bring any because if he showed that he had some, then others might ask him for it. And then the woman, sitting two rows back, did the same. She stood up and, and underneath her, she had been sitting on, on her basket with fish the day. And so it went through the crowd that each person began to show and, and open up and show that they themselves had brought some food that day, but then seeing, worrying that they'd be asked to share had sort of kept it concealed. So Fialine Foz writes, but presently others in the crowd brought out baskets and bags, all who had shared generously with those who had not. And before long, everyone had eaten heartily, and still there was bread untouched. The crowd seemed refreshed and lighter in spirits as their friendliness grew. In Foz's version of the story, there was no magic, but there was a miracle. So how, how many of you have ever been to the Museum of Life and Science in Durham? Oh, lots, of, lots of hands. My, my daughter, Lydia, she loves to go. She loves the train, especially the train tunnel where you scream as loud as you can. Uh, she loves the farm animals, and she loves the new tree houses there. Um, anybody, what's, anybody else have a favorite part that they want to? Anybody, anybody got a favorite part of the life? Yeah, what's your, what's your favorite part? 
The butterfly house. Ooh, that's good. What's your, what's your favorite part? The what? Cool, the block room where you can build stuff. And yes, yes, in the back, one more. The owls. Oh, yeah, the indoor, the indoor animals with the owls. And yeah, one more. The mist. Oh, good, good stuff. I, I want to go. So I want to tell you a little bit about a special exhibition. It's not at the Museum of Life and Science, although the Museum of Life and Science in Durham actually partnered to help another museum create an exhibit. It's, it's an ex exhibition at the Exploratorium in San Francisco where there's a whole special exhibit that's called The Science of Sharing. The Science of Sharing. And the exhibit allows people to explore social science. Why do people do what they do? And there are 17 different stations where people of all ages can, can explore questions having to do with cooperation and competition and trust. For example, one of the things I, I read about it, one of the things that they have there is called the trust drinking fountain. You know, you know how a drinking fountain works, right? You know how it works. You push a button and water comes out and you drink. Well, in the trust drinking fountain, the button is on the other side of the room. And so you have to have a friend go over there and press the button so that you can drink. But, but the friend has a choice of two buttons. One button is water that comes out so you can drink, and the other button squirts the person in the face. <laughs> so I want to be honest with you here. If it, was your, uh, if it was your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister drinking, how many people, how many people would let them drink? <laughs> how, many people, how many people would squirt them in the face? Oh, okay. See, this is... So this morning, I want to talk about a couple of different experiments that scientists have done to explore what makes people share and help each other and what makes them not share and help each other. These experiences, experiments are interesting because we can learn about ourselves and how we interact with other people. The first experiment I want to tell you about was done by two psychologists, Michael Inslicht and Sukhvinder Obi in Toronto. And here is what they did. In the first part of the experiment, they had their subjects write a story about either a time they felt powerful or a time when they felt powerless, like they didn't have a lot of power. And so I want here, like we did last time, we're going we're gonna to do this side of the room first. I'm going to pick on Terry. Terry, would you like to be the powerful side or the powerless side? And you're choosing for everybody here. Powerful. powerful. I had a feeling you did say that, Terry. <laughs> All right, so you guys are the powerful side. And this side then, sorry guys, you guys are the powerless side. And so I want... Um, we're going to talk a little, we'll see if we can turn the, turn the mic on here. If we can get it on. All right. So I'd like for us to think, since we're the powerful side, I'd like for people, who's want, who would uh, share a time in your life when you've felt powerful? Anybody, anybody willing to share? Oh, Brian, look at that. Jumps, jumps right in. Look. Um, I'd have to say when I finish the bottle dance and I'm holding the bottle up in the air, oh, look at I feel that. pretty good. So a successful completion of the dance. Ah, all right. Kate, Kate, when did you feel powerful? When I finished my chemo. Absolutely. That's survivor strength right there. And Ruth? When I got to sing about nuclear energy, we weren't in favor of 33 nuclear power plants and the people of Pacific Gas and Electric were in the front row. So you had that's power of protest and the power of a moral voice and a conscience. All right. I want to hear from the powerless folks. When was there a was there a time in your life when you felt powerless, like you didn't have a lot of power? Yeah, we've got a hand up here. Um when I get teased. When someone, when someone teases, yeah, that, that, that's a good way to make you feel powerless. All right, I'm going to come, come on here. I feel, I feel like Geraldo here. Uh, I was in a big demonstration in Washington, D.C., and it was night, and all of a sudden there was tear gas everywhere and police on horseback. 
So just as we had a really powerful conscience, it can be really, it can really make you feel powerless sometimes standing alone for something you believe. Yeah, do you want to share a time? Yeah? Well, when, when you feel sick and you can't feel, get better, Mm, I know when you when you feel sick when you're under the weather that that can make you feel powerless. So I want to tell you a little bit about this experience, experiment. So they had each side. They had they had one group write about their feeling of powerfulness, and they had another group write about their feelings of powerlessness. And then came the second part of the experiment. They took the subjects and they hooked them up to some sensors that measured their brain activity and that measured their, their nervous energy, the sort of the uh, energy in their hands. And they showed the participants a video of somebody squeezing a rubber ball. Squeezing a rubber ball. And here is what they found. The people who had thought of, of a time when they felt powerless, their brains began to activate and they began to sort of sympathetically mirror the response that their brain acted just like the ball was being squeezed and in fact their hands began to contract a little bit. There was, this, there was a sympathetic reaction. And then when they did it, they hooked the powerful people up to it. There was no, there was no sympathetic reaction at all. There's, there was no mirror response. Here's what the scientists wrote. We found that for those participants who were induced to experience feelings of power, their brains showed virtually no resonance with the actions of another. Conversely, for those participants who were induced to experience feelings of powerlessness, their brains resonated quite a bit. The bad news, the scientists say, is that the powerful are on a neurological level, often simply not motivated to care, to empathize. The good news is that everyone, in theory, is redeemable. It's not a troubling experiment. Want to hear about another experiment that was done? This study involved researchers at The Ohio State University and the studies were then duplicated at, at many universities in France. In the first part of the study, they had two people who played a, who competed at a video game to see who won. It wasn't really a competition because the scientists were going to pick who the winner and who the loser was. In the first part of the study, they had the two people compete and, and then they came in and they announced this person's the winner and this person's the loser. In the next part of the experiment, they were separated and brought to a room and told that they had to prepare a drink for the person they had competed against. And they were given a cup of tomato juice. Who likes tomato juice here? All right. Whoa, it does. I don't really like tomato juice. <laughs> and then there was, and then there was some, some other stuff. Some other stuff, there was like some salt and some Tabasco sauce. And they were also given the information that the person who they had competed against, their opponent, really didn't like spiciness at all, was just had no, had no tolerance for spicy food. So what do, you think the, what do you think the losers did? Would you like a little tomato sauce with your Would you like a little tomato sauce with your actually, actually, no. The people who had lost were actually made the drink as it was requested. They fulfilled the order. What do you think the winners did? Interesting response. What's the lesson that we should take away from this? I think the world's, the world's great religious traditions all contain wisdom that seems, that seems counterintuitive. In, in Taoism, there's that teaching to become rich by sharing and to become strong 
by becoming weak. In Christianity, we're told the last will be first and the first will be last and that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And these experiments and, and others like them remind us all, especially those of us who tend to be the winners, who are more likely to be the ones who feel powerful, who are more likely to win, that we need to especially remind ourselves to practice sharing and cooperation and empathy, generosity and gratitude and kindness. Thank you for listening to the ancient story. Thank you for listening to the science experiments.